Welcome everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for this evening's webinar. Uh, my name is Josie Cooper, and I'm pleased to be here this evening on behalf of the Vision Health Advocacy Council, the host of tonight's webinar on living with and managing thyroid eye disease. I am very, very pleased to be joined tonight by our TED patient advocate, West of All, as well as our um, TED expert, Dr. Sonali Kachigian. So as we get started, I do want to take just a quick moment to preview this evening's agenda. So you can see the agenda up on, on your screen. Uh, we're going to kick things off with just a brief intro to the Vision Health Advocacy Coalition, or, or VHAC as we call it, so you know really who we are and, and why we're hosting tonight's program. Then I'll turn it to um, patient and advocate Wes, and um, he'll share his experience living with and managing thyroid eye disease. From there, we'll turn to our TED expert, Dr. Sonali Kachikian, who will present on thyroid eye disease, what we call thyroid eye disease 101, I suppose, um, causes, treatments, the basics of really what patients need to know. And then we will turn to audience Q&A. Uh, we know that typically folks come to an event like this with a handful of questions that you might have been thinking about, um, looking for answers to, and so we'll leave plenty of time for, for Q&A at the end. Um, but I'll note, you know, if you have questions throughout the program for Wes, for Dr. Kachikian, um, please go ahead and ask those anytime. Uh, the Zoom Q&A box is open. Uh, that should be at the bottom of your screen. And so feel free to type those in at any point and we'll address those questions during the Q&A. Uh, I'll also just note that this program is being recorded and so it will be posted to our website in the next um, few weeks so that folks can come back to it for additional viewing, share it with a, a care partner or a member of your family, anything like that, that might be helpful. And I do want to just uh, note that while we do have a doctor here, um, for your individual condition, the best answers can come from your doctor. And so we would urge you to seek treatment um, and find a, a healthcare provider that's right for you. So with that, um, we'll go ahead and get started. So your host this evening, the Vision Health Advocacy Coalition, is a nonprofit patient advocacy coalition that works to ensure that those living with vision conditions have access to patient-centered care. And so we're really working to promote policies that will allow patients to access the devices, the tests, the treatments that you and your doctor believe is, is are going to be the best course of treatment. Um, along with that comes a lot of education through events like, like tonight's program, awareness building, um, and other advocacy activities. And you'll find here the Vision Health Advocacy Coalition's membership. So we have a number of organization, um, organizations that we partner with. And you'll see here, we've got more than a dozen um, organizations that we're really collaborating with on an everyday basis. So through this network, we are able to engage um, patients through programs like tonight's. Uh, we're able to develop educational resources. We're able to collaborate um, and promote each other's work. And so you can learn more about these organizations and the work that they do by visiting our website, um, visionhealthadvocacy.org. And as I, I said, a, a huge part of our mission and the work that we do is developing resources that can be used to support patients, support care partners, support healthcare providers, as well as educate policymakers on patient-centered care and vision health. And so here you'll find just a handful of resources, um, videos, toolkits, papers that we have developed on thyroid eye disease and vision conditions in general. And so we'd really encourage folks to, to take a look at those resources, share those with others um, as they might be beneficial. And uh, I mentioned our website, but you can find the URL if, if uh, you didn't want to write that down. And uh, I'll also just note that we are on social media. We're on Twitter. We are on Facebook. Um, and so we would really encourage folks who are interested to follow us there. Um, it's a great way to stay up to date on new programs, new events, new materials, um, and just keep in touch. So with that, I'm excited to get started with our program, and I'd like to now welcome patient advocate West of All. Wes, so thanks so much for being here. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. 
So I'd, I'd love to kick off um, this conversation by just hearing a little bit more about your story. Can you just tell us a little bit more about your, your background, yourself? Yeah, uh, my name's uh, Wes Duval. I'm uh, 46 years old. I work as a uh, locomotive engineer for uh, BNSF Railway. Um, born and raised in Sundance, Wyoming, and uh, now I live in Gillette, Wyoming. So running trains for the railroad, basically. Fantastic. Thanks, Wes. So um, let's talk about thyroid eye disease. You know, when did your symptoms first start? What were they? You know, how did they impact your life? Um, it first started around uh, 2012. I was actually in the uh, training program to be an engineer. And uh, I started first getting really super tired all the time. Couldn't, you know, and uh, just had a hard time staying awake. Basically, everything's just run down completely. And uh, finally went in and turned out it, uh, that I had Graves disease, which was a long process to diagnose and everything. And uh, once that got going, everything was okay there for a while. But then, then that's when the eye started at, uh, after that, actually, before it was, you know, completely normal vision, didn't have the bulging eyes or any of that stuff, but it all started within a year after Graves, I would say. And it's just progressively gotten worse and worse ever since. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned the diagnosis process, but can you talk a little bit more about what that was like, you know, how long it took, what that, that um, process was like for you, for your family? It, it took, it took months to, to actually diagnose the uh, Graves disease. They, you know, they thought it was anything from possible cancer, leukemia, and all kinds of things. So, you know, lots of, lots and lots of different testing to get the mm -hmm. fact, actual diagnosis finally done. And it was, it was stressful, <laughs> very stressful. I was in a, actually in Kansas city for three weeks for training. And here I am waiting for the results, you know, thinking, you know, maybe I have cancer this whole time. So it was, it's actually kind of a relief to hear once I, you know, they said it was Graves disease. It was big relief off of me. So, but. That's helpful. Wes. I think that's a, a common mm -hmm. feeling, you know, when you're waiting for a diagnosis and you're, you're wondering mm -hmm. what it is, it's, it's helpful to just know um, and be able to kind of have that diagnosis. Right. So at, at what point, um, you know, going back to kind of how, what brought you to your search for that diagnosis, what made you decide that you were ready to seek treatment or needed to seek treatment? You know, what kind of, of doctor did you see? Uh, first, it was just a regular doctor. You know, um, I think I went to the walk-in clinic actually said, telling them, you know, I can't stay awake. I mean, I was, it started, I was, I was missing work all the time, you know, because I didn't want to get on a train and operate a train, you know, like barely keep my eyes open. So I had really no choice to, but to go in and, and seek some kind of treatment out for that. And then with the eyes, you know, it's just started the double vision started um, looking just obviously it was pretty obvious right away that something was going on with my eye just in appearance wise. So basically make life better I had to do I had to go in and get treatment so mm -hmm. and can you can you talk a little bit about that treatment how have you managed your thyroid eye disease symptoms you know have have treatments been effective for you um so far to this point not a not a thing has been effective at all they've tried uh several different types of eye drops um many many different pills for steroids they've, they've given me injections um I had these liquids I used to have to drink every other day for a while, and basically nothing's uh, done a thing yet. Um, currently, we've started the Tepezida infusions. I've uh, done two of those. They do one every three weeks, exactly, and uh, there's eight infusions. So they tell me after four or five, I should start to see progress. So really hopeful for that one. Absolutely. Well, we're, we're hopeful on your behalf too. I think, um, that effective treatment is, you know, really what everybody is, is searching so hard for. Um, you know, you, you've mentioned your journey a little bit. You, we know that for many folks living with thyroid eye disease, the, the mental health components can also be pretty significant. You know, what was that like for you? How have you coped with your diagnosis? Ah, uh, that's stressful again there's definitely a huge mental health aspect that people don't really talk about. Um, you know, I'm to the point where you, you start to see the change in your, in your appearance. And, uh, next thing you know, you avoid mirrors. Like I tried, I, I can't stand looking in a mirror. I avoid them at all costs, pictures. 
I don't take pictures with my family. You know, you go back and look at all these events and you'll see the whole family together. And I'm missing it almost every one of them. I, I just can't stand getting pictures taken. Um, not only that, you got, you got people talking to you, you know, and uh, they'll make fun of you at times. You know, they'll, they'll call you. I've been called anything from a freak to bug eyes to, you know, strange looking. And, and that really affects you. It, it, it seriously does. You have a, you know, you get depression all kinds of things like that. Um, I stopped wearing contact lenses and I actually went and bought the biggest pair of glasses I could find just to try to take, you know, something away from my uh, eyesight actually. So it would, you know, change my appearance so people wouldn't notice it so visibly. But yeah, it's been very stressful. You start to find yourself unattractive to your partner thinking that, you know, they don't want you at all because you, you know, you're, you're basically ugly is what you feel like. So it's been definitely a journey and it's, it's tough. It's tough to deal with. Absolutely. And, and Wes, I really appreciate you sharing that. And I'm sure the patients who are on this call really appreciate that, that kind of overview of, of your story there, because that is a really significant part of this disease that I don't think always gets enough attention. Not um, have you, have you found that anything has been helpful as you kind of manage the mental health components of it? Not really, honestly, just, just trying to stay as strong as you can, not caring, you know, you start to, you start to get a thick skin, I think, kind of the longer you have it, you know, you just, it doesn't bother you nearly as much after you, you hear it all the time from people. So that's about all you can do is just stay strong. Absolutely. And uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't give a, a quick pitch to, to the resources that we have at the Vision Health Advocacy Coalition um, and our member resources, which um, I think can be really helpful for, for folks who might be looking for mental health resources who are on this line. Um, Wes, can you talk about, you know, how you're doing today, you know, progress that you've made, you know, who you might credit that to? Um, Dr. Kachikian has been absolutely amazing everything she's done to help, you know, getting the infusions going. Um, like I said, there hasn't been a whole lot of progress just yet. You know, I still have, I'll have times where I have double vision, you know, I can, I can see clearly, but you have to really focus to get my eyes to come back together. And um, the hardest thing lately is the last year. Or so I've actually had it where I basically consider I consider my eye popping out my right eye where it, uh, the, the uh, eyelid actually retracts behind the eyeball. <laughs> so the eyeball actually sticks out and it's, it's probably the most painful thing I've ever felt in my life. Mm -hmm. You know, you sit there and all you can do is close your eye and try to push it back in as far as you can and pull the eyelids back. But hopefully, like I said, with the, the infusions coming on, hopefully there's a huge progress to come and I'm very hopeful. Absolutely. Um, I know the infusion treatment has been a, incredible, um, incredible option for a lot of patients. I um, mean, I like what you said about, um, your doctor patient relationship, because that's a, I think a really important thing to build, um, to find someone you trust to, to really be able to rely on that relationship. Yeah. She's amazing. Well, we're excited to hear from her here <laughs> shortly. Um, so, um, Wes, you know, before we move into kind of our, our clinician presentation, um, we'll just ask, you know, what advice do you have for patients living with thyroid eye disease? Just hang in there. You know, there, there's, 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 there's hope now with, with the Tepeza, at least for me, um, don't let it bother you. Don't, don't avoid the pictures. Like I said, don't avoid the mirror. You know, you can't get that back ever. So just stay strong, be as strong as you can, seek help. You know, if, if you're struggling mentally, especially don't, don't waste any time, go get his help as fast as you can. I love that. Thank you so much, Wes. Um, and if, if anybody has a question for Wes, um, we're going to have some Q and A at the end. Um, so please feel free to type that in the Q and A box at any point. Thanks so much, Wes. Absolutely. 
So um, next, we want to hear the physician perspective. Um, so I, I'm pleased to be joined by Dr. Sonali Kachikian, um, who is a self-driven and passionate endocrinologist. She has established a large, successful practice at Monument Health, a hospital-based private practice. And with a team-based approach, she works alongside diabetic educators and CEs to provide comprehensive care to her patients. Um, she strives to give her patients the best care by staying board certified and abreast of current guidelines and research. And she enjoys working, teaching, and learning alongside her team of APPs, nurses, and diabetic educators to create a center of excellence. So um, Dr. Chikikian, thank you so much for being here, and I will turn it to you. Thank you so much for having me. Can everybody hear me? Um, thank yeah. you for having me. Thank you to Wes for being so vulnerable and coming out and talking about it. I think he exemplifies the reason why I do this. I feel like I have a unique perspective where I see a lot of people with thyroid eye disease. And my goal is to try to be able to help as many people as I can. That's our ultimate goal in the scheme of life. So with that, um, can we just go to the next slide? All right. So I want to I want to give you guys enough information about thyroid eye disease. By no means is this a full comprehensive overview of eye disease. It is very important at least to start the conversation between yourself and your provider. Um, so and I and I didn't include everything because I think it's important to be able to ask questions. I think it's important to be able to ask West questions. So if you do have questions or there's questions that you have about some of the slides that I'm presenting, don't think that this is the end. This is just the beginning. So, you know, Graves' disease. Graves' disease is when you have an overactive thyroid. Graves' disease can present with palpitations, increased fatigue, feeling more hot than usual, weight loss, which some people like, but not for the right circumstances. And then I think it's important to identify that one in two people with Graves' disease are affected by eye disease. And as I have mentioned above, thyroid eye disease or TED is its very own entity. As more and more research is being done about TED, there is thought that it is an autoimmune process that's driven by antibodies that bind, and we'll talk about it, to this IGF-1 receptor that set off this whole cascade of inflammatory conditions that leads to the symptoms that you're experiencing. Um, the symptoms include physical appearance changes, bulging eyes, buggy eyes, misalignment of your eyes that can cause double vision, pain, dryness, and then for some patients, it can lead to vision loss. Next slide. So who is at risk? Patients who are older are at increased risk. Women, unfortunately, compared to men are at slightly higher risk. Um, obviously, having Graves' disease puts you at higher risk because it's those antibodies. Most of the patients I see usually have thyroid conditions. Having said that, I have seen patients who only have ocular symptoms, and I've seen patients who have Graves' disease who have no eye symptoms. Smoking definitely increases your risk two to eightfold. Having radioactive iodine treatment for some people can increase your risk by about 15 to 20%. Having said that, it is still a viable option, but you need to talk to your doctor and they need to evaluate you for your symptoms. Next slide. Okay, so how does this process work? You have your immune cells and what ends up happening is there's mistalk. Instead of working normally, your immune system starts targeting this IGF-1 receptor, and it's found on fibroblasts or the cells within the eye. And these fibroblasts help do a lot of different things. And once this IGF-1 receptor is bound by um, these antibodies, it sets off this whole event. So next slide. I love pictures because I feel as though they explain things a lot. So here, I guess the way to think of it is your eye is in a fixed box. You really can't move, you know, the box that your eye is in. You have muscles, you have the yellow, which is the fat, and then you have the front of the eye. And then, and then what ends up happening is you have this disease process where it binds to this IGF-1 receptor on these fibroblast cells that are overexposed in people who have Graves' eye disease. Next slide. 
So then this just shows you a representation. What ends up happening is the fat tissue starts increasing, the muscles start to get bigger. There's not much more place for the eyeball to go. So what the eyeball does is it moves forward. And that's, and then as it moves forward, the whites of your eyes or the corneas are, are more exposed to air and that can cause dryness and redness. It can cause itchiness. It can cause increased watering. That bulging is called proptosis. The retraction is called lid retraction. And as a result, patients can have double vision. Patients can have loss of vision because what you're not seeing is in the center of the eye, from the back of the eyelid to the back of the eye, you have the optic nerve. So if you're having all this inflammation, the optic nerve can get compressed and that for some people can lead to like very serious immersion complications. Next slide. So as Wes was saying, it is very, very common for patients to have psychosocial issues. Um, the biggest of which are depression and anxiety. And we'll talk about this. It, these are common not only during the acute phase, but also when you have chronic disease. Um, so I think it's something to be very sensitive to. I don't think that you should feel as though you're alone. I don't think that you should be embarrassed. I think you need to be able to talk to your doctor when something's not quite right. Next slide. I just wanted to include this slide. There's a lot, a lot of words on this slide. You may hear something called a clinical activity score. Some ophthalmologists use it. Some ophthalmologists don't use it. They just state what the symptoms are. But essentially, as we go through and see somebody who has thyroid eye disease, we start checking off how many of these symptoms you have. The higher your score, the more increased risk you are or the more acute your disease process is. So it can include pain with movement of your eye. It can be spontaneous pain. It can be swelling of the eyes. It can be swelling of the internal part of the eye. It can be redness above the eye. It can be that the squishy material underneath the eye starts to bulge out and you'll see that. Um, it's, it's all these different things. It's also proptosis, which is bulging forward of the eye and there's fancy schmancy tools to measure it. Um, some people can have loss of color vision. The most common symptoms are those of double vision and the bulging of your eyes. So next slide. So what we see in the office is what happens at the front part of the eye. And some providers, depending on what they need to do, especially your ophthalmologist or your oculoplastic specialist who are specialists for thyroid eye disease, will sometimes do a CAT scan. And then when you do a CAT scan, you can see some of these symptoms. So the arrows that you see, the red arrow and the yellow arrow point towards inflammation or swelling of the muscles behind the eye. Um, you can kind of see this over in the picture on the left where you're seeing the four different muscles around each eyeball. And you'll notice that they're way thicker than what they normally are. So. This is also something important and it tells you about the disease process. Next slide. So you may hear different phases. This is a Rundle's curve. I just wanted to kind of say like the dynamic phase or the acute phase can last anywhere from six months to three years, um, but it's not anything fixed. Static is when you have the symptoms and they're kind of they're present, but they're not changing, or maybe the symptoms have gotten better. Next slide. So what is the goal of treatment? Obviously the goal of treatment is to give patients good quality of life, to decrease the inflammation, not just in the front of the eye, but in the back of the eye, to make you feel as though you have some of your freedom back and you can live a normal life and you don't have to be singled out by someone you, know, you don't even know. Um, all these things improve your quality of life. So at the end of the day, if you ask me what my goal is, my goal is to make you a happier person. Next slide. I think it's really, really important to talk to your provider. On average, like Wes said, most patients, especially with thyroid eye disease, will go anywhere from two years to five years before they're truly diagnosed and they start on the road to treatment. That's not even when they start getting 
symptomatic relief. That's just when they get to the right person to be able to help them. Um, it's important to figure out what stage of disease you're at. Is it mild and it needs to be monitored and there are simple things you can do? Or is it getting to be moderate and severe where just these simple things are fine, but you need some other sort of intervention? Um, if it's mild disease, observation is great. If you're lucky enough to live somewhere where there's an oculoplastic specialist or an eye doctor, I usually recommend you see them so that they can see you at maybe the mild stage. So when things get worse, if they get worse, they're you know there to follow along. Stop smoking, which I'm sure you've heard from all your doctors, but in this situation, it really helps. Restricting salt so that you decrease some of the inflammation. Um, lubrication. I tell my patients that I want them to use lubricating eye drops, not Visine, but just lubricating eye drops. And sometimes patients will like to use lubricating gel, especially at night, because, because of that bulging of your eyes, your eyelid isn't closing completely when you sleep. So it's so painful when you get up in the morning. There's also some research that's been shown that taking selenium just over the counter has been helpful. Next slide. We kind of touched on this, depending on where you sit in terms of where your disease process is, they'll decide on what the right treatment is. Treatment includes anything from observation to steroids. Usually it's infusion, usually it's high dose steroids to radiation, which we don't really do as much anymore, to surgeries. And the issue with surgeries are they've worked, it's fine, but when you start your surgery process, it's not just one surgery. It's one surgery to fix one issue. And that's usually followed up by three, four, five additional surgeries. So, um, so it's not a simple, simple process. Not every location and where you live, you will find somebody who is apt to, you know, who's apt to do all the studies and surgeries. So, and then um, this new medication, Tepeza which is the first FDA approved medication for thyroiditis disease. There's nothing else like it. There's no competition. It got approved in January of 2020. It was a little bit tricky because right around the time that it was being approved, we were going into like the depths of COVID. So I think that kind of made it a little bit harder for it to get to people. Um, and the whole purpose of the study, and we'll talk about this on the next slide, is... Um, and what they, and you can go to the next slide, is what they really studied was like if they can reduce the amount of swelling or the bulging of your eye and double vision. Those were the two things that they studied. Um, I've sort of touched upon this, like, you know, surgical options or orbital decompression, but then you do strabismus surgery, which is realigning the muscles, and then you do eyelid surgery to get rid of a lot of the symptoms. So we kind of touched on this. This is just a little bit more detail. Uh, next slide. So what is Tepeza? Tepeza is a fully monoclonal antibody that binds to the IGF-1 receptor. So I told you it's these antibodies that are created by thyroid eye disease that cause, that bind to the IGF-1 receptor and cause it to get activated and cause all these problems within your body. So if they can make a monoclonal antibody that binds to the IGF-1 receptor, then the troubled antibody from thyroid eye disease can bind there. Um, and so you don't have that cascade of symptoms. In the past, most insurance companies said that you have to have this clinical activity score, which is the graph that I gave you, a four or greater. You will see now that um, Tepeza actually got FDA approval, not just for acute disease, but also chronic disease. So you don't really need to have a clinical activity score greater than four. It can be smaller than that. Um, in the study, every patient who got the medication had some degree of improvement. In the bulging out of your eye, anything that reduces the bulging of your eye by two millimeters was considered significant. However, in the Tepeza study, most patients had a 3.3 millimeter decrease. Again, the worse your symptoms are, the better improvement you see they noticed that double vision got significantly better. Um, like all other medicines, you know, it's not all rainbows and butterflies. I will tell you that the majority of people who take the medication go on to complete it. 89% of patients who were given the medication went on to complete all eight infusions. 
versus 93% in the placebo trial. So I have seen patients in my clinic, and even though we talk about some of the side effects, they will tell me the side effects are nothing compared to what their life is like. They absolutely took the medication. Side effects. Um, side effects are important. Side effects are something that you need to talk to your doctor about. I will just touch on the most common ones. The common ones include muscle aches. Some people will notice some hair loss, which usually comes back. Hearing impairments can be seen in some patients, usually older patients. Younger patients feel as though their head is maybe underwater. So it's not just the medication. Just having Graves' disease can cause hearing impairments in up to 30% of people. So your doctor will decide if you need a hearing test, if you don't need a hearing test. Um, now that we're giving this to more people, we notice that some people are having a rise in their blood sugar reading. So if you're somebody who's on the edge, it's something that your doctor will likely monitor. Um, you cannot get pregnant when you're on this medication. Some people also get nausea. Those are usually the most common side effects. And I take the time to talk to my patients about it before we start the medication. I give them medication so that they, if they have any of these, they you know can let me know. One piece of advice I can give you across the board is if you're somebody who's getting the infusion, taking a magnesium supplement um, is fantastic because it helps reduce some of the muscle cramps. Um, if you have inflammatory bowel disease like ulcerative colitis or Crohn's, it can make that worse. So I think it's something to be aware of. Next slide. I just wanted to put this picture on. I wanted to let you know that it's a total of eight infusions. The first and second infusion are given over 90 minutes. The first infusion is a half dose. The second infusion is a full dose given over 90 minutes. And then doses three to eight are full doses given at about 60 minutes. It needs to be given at an infusion center. It is important for people to finish all eight rounds of therapy. Like Wes told you, I told him that most patients start to notice some sort of difference after the third or fourth infusion. Having said that, in studies, if you went from, you know, we like the fourth infusion to the last infusion, 56% of people had improvement in symptoms. So if you don't see improvement after the second, third, fourth dose, please don't feel as though you are abnormal. It is important to finish all of them. Next slide. You know, a picture is worth a thousand words for people who are interested in this and the people who are on this advocacy phone call, you know what your symptoms are like and you know what the future possibly holds. And I hope that's very exciting for you. I know it's kind of hard to see, but if you look at the top picture and you look at the center of her eyeball and you look at the little white dot, which is the right light reflection, you'll notice that in the right eye, it is near the center, but in the left eye, it's a little bit over to the left. That just goes to show you that she's having double vision. And then if you look at the slide below, you'll notice that that little white dot is near the center, which shows that her double vision has improved significantly. Next slide. So what can you do? You can find somebody who's a thyroid eye disease specialist. If you go on the Horizon site who makes Tepeza, there's a list there of people who can help you. I think it's important for you to find somebody who is going to be your advocate. I think it's important for your care team to work together. Nobody gets a prize if they're the first one to the bat. It is all about getting patients the improvement and quality of life they deserve. Like they mentioned, it's important to get the emotional support you need. It's important to come to realism with the fact that you can't do this alone. It's important to reduce stress. Um, Elevate the head of your bed. Don't smoke, don't smoke, don't smoke. Get eye drops. Those are some of the simple things I can tell you. Um, with that, I'm going to stop in terms of my education process here. And uh, you're more than welcome to ask me any questions. Thanks so much, Dr. Kachikian. Um, and Wes, I'd love to invite you back as well. We have a number of questions for, for both um, our panelists today. And so I'll, I'll just kind of walk through some of these. Um, 
And one of the first ones that we saw, and, and maybe you can take this, Dr. Kachikian, um, uh, TED Genetics, you know, or I guess this actually is directed at US. Was you the only one in your family with, with thyroid eye disease? Yeah. Um, nobody else has it that I know of, at least, or been diagnosed. Okay. So I will say, having said that, there is a genetic component of it autoimmune diseases where your body's immune system is not firing correctly, kind of travel in packs. Other common autoimmune diseases are like celiac disease, which is problems with gluten. It can be Hashimoto's, which is the opposite of overactive thyroid. It's an underactive thyroid. Ulcerative colitis, rheumatoid arthritis, those are common things. So even if somebody has eye disease, if you go and talk to them, somebody else may have another autoimmune disease. Very, very helpful. Thank you both. Um, Wes, uh, there's a couple of questions here about the infusion process and what it's been like for you. You know, what has that process looked like? Where do you go? You know, how long does it take? Anything you can share about what the actual infusion process is like? Yeah, um, you just go down. It's only a few blocks from my house, actually. So that's pretty easy down to the infusion center here in, in Gillette. And uh, you go in get comfortable in a chair they they hook you up you know do your blood pressure all the normal symptoms and stuff like that and then then uh, put an iv in your arm basically and you sit there and watch tv for about an hour and a half and pull the iv out i mean it's it's real simple nothing to it at all that's that's helpful i think infusion sometimes can feel a little scary to patients um so it's it's great to hear that it's kind of a, an easy process Very. um and, and there's a question for, for you here, not to put you on the spot, Wes, but uh, we've got someone who's hoping you'll come back after your sixth or somewhere in their infusion to talk more about your results and your experience. So um, hopefully we'll be able to follow up. Right. Absolutely. No problem at all there. Awesome. Um, so I think you've already maybe covered this, Dr. Kashikian, but um, if you're on Tepeza, when do you start seeing changes to your eyes? I think that'd be helpful just to reiterate for folks. So there's no hard and fast rule. I believe most patients start seeing improvement after the third dose or fourth dose, but there's up to 50% of patients who don't see the full level of improvement until they finished all eight courses. Mm. All eight treatments in the one course. Thanks so much. Um, and we had a, a related question actually um, from someone who says, you know, what if I go through all eight infusions and there's not as much of a change as I want? You know, can you do more? What does that look like? So the simple answer to that question is no. And in the studies that they did, every patient had some degree of improvement. There's not a lot of drugs. Like the number needed to treat is like 1.36. So it's not even like for every 10 people you treat, one patient gets improvement. Every patient has some degree of improvement. Will it be like the worse your symptoms, the better your options are, right? Or the better your outcomes are because you can visibly see the change. But every patient had an improvement. In the trials at 184 people who were studied in the trial, half being in the placebo, half being in the trial, there was a total of, I want to say, five people, five or six people in the treatment dose that actually, I think it was like five people who didn't respond. So they were reevaluated by their provider and they were given a second course of eight treatments. And of those three of the four responded, one was lost to follow up. And then in another uh, set of, I believe, four to five patients, they responded, they were great. And then within about six months to seven months, they had a resurgence of symptoms, which is not common, which is not, this is not the norm. And in those patients, those who did get a second dose, all of them responded. Very, very helpful. Thank you so much. Um, a, another question, and maybe I'll ask you this, this first, Wes, and then turn it to you, Dr. Kuchikian. Um, if I don't feel like my current treatment is working, what should I do? I know you've got experience with that. You know, how do you self-advocate? I think you just need to, oh, no, go ahead, Wes, you do it. <laughs> I was just going to say, just, um, 
stick to it. You know, like she's like she was saying before, do all eight infusions if if that's the step you're doing. If if you don't feel it's working, you know, talk to your doctor what the other options are, but don't don't give up. Keep going and finish what you're instructed to do. Thanks so much, Wes. Anything to add to that, Dr. Kuchigian? No, I just think you have to find somebody who's your advocate. So once you've identified as having thyroid eye disease, um, if you don't have somebody in your area, I think it's important. You know, usually you'll find people who have a passion for it. So I keep saying oculoplastics, oculoplastics, but there's lots of people who do cornea or there's lots of like general ophthalmologists who have some sort of interest in it or they have enough of a network where they'll say, I don't do it, but this person does. So go find that person. Thanks so much. Um, and I saw this one come through in the chat, um, but you know, when considering treatment options, what are some questions that I should be prepared to ask my provider or that I can ask my provider? I, I direct that to you know either of you. For me, I will say um, when I see my patients, because now I'm an endocrinologist, so I don't necessarily like they don't come into me with thyroid eye disease symptoms. It's something that I've kind of taken on because I kind of asked, just like I asked Wes and harassed him probably at every visit. I was like, "How are you? What's going on? Look at this new thing I found." But um, I think I think you just like people have brought it in. Like people have seen the commercials where they'll say, "Hey, I found out about this," or. I found out about this. Am I a candidate for this or am I not a candidate for this? And we'll have like an honest discussion and say, listen, in the scheme of life, like, you know, here's the benefits, here's the drawbacks, um, kind of where you are right now, your symptoms, like, don't reach the point where I feel like you need this medication because the risks may outweigh the benefits for you, but let's continue to monitor it over time. I will also be super candid and say to patients, like, this is not like going to the to the pharmacy and picking up like cough drops. I mean, this is a process. Like people will complete it, complete it because they're having significant eye symptoms, but it's not just like a, sure, I'll get some of this too. So it's just important to find somebody who's going to advocate for you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, a, a couple of, of other questions related to, um, to PESA. Um, Dr. Kachiki, and this is probably for you. Can you have cataract surgery with thyroid eye disease and while on to PESA? That is a really good question. I, I am not an ophthalmologist, so I would ask the ophthalmologist this question, but if I had to speculate, if I had to speculate, I would say that for any kind of symptoms or for like, you know, any kind of anterior segment process, you, if there's an inflammatory component and you're on Tepeza, they may say to you, it's better for you to finish your Tepeza infusions, get to some level of stability before they do any kind of like cataract surgery. Because I know cataract surgery, it's fantastic. And it will help you with your vision, but it can also cause dry eyes for people. So it's something to consider. Again, I'm not an ophthalmologist, so you have to talk to your board certified ophthalmologist for the actual answer, but. Thank you so much. Um, Wes, a, a question for you um, from a, a care partner, actually. So um, someone who says, I'm caring for someone with thyroid eye disease. Do you have any recommendations on what I can do to be most supportive? Just be there, you know, give them, give them suggestions, tell them what they can do, help them any questions they have, basically just support them, give them, I, I've been lucky with Dr. Kachikian, you know, she, she, like she said, she harasses me constantly, but it, it's just such a good relationship that, you know, make them as comfortable as possible, you know, tell them their options, let them know that things are going to work out. You're going to be all right, basically. I think that's great advice. Thanks, Wes. Um, so a, a couple of insurance questions, actually, um, Dr. Kachikian, do you typically see that your patient's insurance covers to Um, you know, what is that process typically like? So I will say that, um, 
Sometimes I have to write additional letters, but I have never had a patient who has not been approved for Tepeza. Um, sometimes they will come back and say, you know, have you tried steroids? Sometimes now that it's on their radar, they'll say, have you gotten a CAT scan? Um, sometimes they'll say, it's important for you to see an ophthalmologist, which you should see an ophthalmologist and an oculoplastic specialist. Sometimes if ophthalmologists see them, they'll say it's important for you to see an endocrinologist. Um, but apart from jumping through a few hoops, I have not had an issue. In fact, Horizon actually has something called a patient, patient like it's a PAL, patient advisory liaison. So Wes will tell you, for us, it's this lovely lady named Juanita, where when I fill out the form and I send it in to Tepeza, they assign you to a patient advocate who will take you from when I've sent in the enrollment form to getting you approved to making sure that they call you before your first infusion to um, answering your doctor's questions when she is so upset that somebody did not give you the medication appropriately um, to calling Wes. I mean, ask Wes. I'm sure he's heard from her. Oh, Juanita, she's, she's unbelievable. She, she'll text me all the time, just randomly even, you know, during the middle of the week, just, hey, how's your day going? You know, and any problems you've had whatsoever, she'll, she, she gets right away and she's like, oh, well, the infusion center did this. Let me call him. I'll call you right back. And she's on it like that. I mean, she's been phenomenal. Couldn't ask for anything better there. That's fantastic. And, and thank you both. It's uh, encouraging to hear that there are so many resources as folks navigate the insurance process, which I think everybody on this line knows can be very, very complicated. Um, and I'll also note, because someone mentioned the prior authorization process, we have a number of resources that actually talk to vision health patients about navigating that process. There are a lot of things that um, that you can do to get through that process more easily. Um, there are appeals, there are, are you know, um, ways to kind of make that work. And so um, if you're dealing with that process, please let us know and we're happy to, to point you to resources. Um, so another question for you, Dr. Kachikian, um, since Tepeza is now approved for chronic thyroid eye disease, does that mean it's easier to get approved for a second round? So I think the first part of the statement is going to be easier. It's easier to get approved, or hopefully it will be easier to get approved. I think the second round business, I think that um, it's an expensive medicine. There have been people who've been able to get a second round, but I want to, again, stress, like, as we treat more and more people, I'm sure there'll be some who need it. But typically, most patients don't need a second round. But hopefully the answer to that question should be yes. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and then a, a couple of questions actually about the phases of, of this. So um, you talked about the different phases. Does my treatment plan depend on which phase my disease is in? So it used to, I mean, I think when they first like came out with the medicine, it was during your acute phase or like acutely changing, but now Tepeza has gotten in front of the FDA and it's been approved for chronic phase. So no, it should not matter. Perfect. I think it's now based then, on uh, the severity of symptoms. Okay. And a, a related question, uh, what happens after you go through the acute phase? Does it eventually stop getting worse? So, you know, this is an excellent question. And I actually asked one of, um, a really wonderful ophthalmologist who's actually a cornea specialist in Chicago. I said, what are these phases? What, what, what does this mean? I'll tell you what it is in, you know, Graves disease. But, um, and she said, I don't know what it is about these phases. I think they're trying to get away from that. So when I did it and I like read the information and stuff, that's why I kind of said like six months to about three years. Cause that's usually when it's acting up. And then I think it goes into chronic, but I can't, I can't speak to that. That's just what I will say. I will say in Graves disease, like an actual Graves disease that affects your thyroid, you can have a phase where it gets acute or it acts up and then usually goes into dormancy. For everybody, it doesn't stay in dormancy. Some people, you stay dormant for a few months and then it acts up again based on a stress that your body is experiencing. For other people, you can stay dormant for years and years and years. So I would think that 
thyroid eye disease is like that too. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and then one other question, um, have you seen any patients recover from thyroid eye disease after they have had their thyroid surgically removed? So I understand there are act, there's an active stage of, uh, TED, um, how do you define a stable stage, you know, in stable stage, will the TED symptoms stop developing or go away? So, so a lot simple, in there. No. So the simple, the simple answer is, you know, Graves disease, one in two people who have Graves disease can have thyroid eye disease, but thyroid eye disease, it's its very own entity. It has its very own course. So is it important to treat your thyroid? Yes. But will, will treating your thyroid make the eye disease go away, maybe for some people, but that just may be a fluke. So I think once you have thyroid eye disease, that needs to be treated specifically. I will tell you that in studies and trials, they have noticed that for patients who get radioactive iodine, yes, the radioactive iodine can make things worse, but after you get radioactive iodine, which kills your thyroid, and it can take anywhere from like six weeks to three months or so, that little bit of phase where you're going from active disease at like hyperthyroidism to hypothyroidism, if you become significantly hypothyroid, that can make your eye disease a little bit worse. So usually I follow my patients really, really, really closely during that little bit of phase. So I try to catch them before they get super hypothyroid. And I know that can make it worse. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that. Um, and then there's just a couple left in the chat. So again, um, folks, if, if you've got questions that you've not gotten answered yet, I know we've talked through a lot, a lot of material, but um, if you've got any last questions, please feel free to, to pop them into the Q&A box now. Um, so uh, another one for you, Dr. Kachikian, um, if you get to PESA, do you still need eyelid surgery? Will it make my eyes look normal again? So if you go to the Horizon website and on the other side, you know, um, you will notice that patients have significant, significant improvement. I don't know if I'd say their eyes go back to being 100%, but they look so, so, so much better. So again, like anything else, I would say more and more oculoplastics, more and more ophthalmologists, because they know the journey that it takes, prefer not to do surgeries right off the bat. They prefer to put patients on Tebeza see how they do, see how much of their symptoms improve, see what degree of proptosis they can improve, which is the bulging of their eye. And then they'll evaluate for, okay, we got to this point with this medication. You're still having symptoms. Okay, now let's move forward and do um, eyelid surgery. Thank you so much. Um, and then there is a, a question about... Um, for folks that are based in Canada or internationally and, and Tepeza availability. Um, so every, you know, um, country around the world, everybody's got a different process. So, um, we're happy to maybe, um, answer that offline, just depending on, on your location, if that's helpful. And, um, I think that maybe all the questions we have, um, which is, is great because we're running right on time, but, um, Dr. Kachikian, Wes, thank you both so much for your time. You, as we as we close out tonight's program, I just want to ask, you know, um, if there's kind of one piece of advice or one, you know, big thought you'd like to leave folks on the line with tonight, um, what would that be? Wes, do you want to go first? Sure. I would say just uh, stick with it. You know, don't don't get down on yourself. You know you're going to, you're going to feel bad. You're going to feel horrible. Just fight through it and don't let it get to you. I would say it's important for you to educate yourself. I think it's important for you to find an advocate. Um, unfortunately, sometimes you have to be your own advocate in today's day and age. But again, just like Wes said, like, keep going, do the research. There's answers. So you don't have to suffer. So Find somebody who's going to advocate for you. Absolutely. I love that. Um, well, thank you both so, so much for sharing your time, sharing your stories, sharing your expertise. Um, we so appreciate it. And, and to everybody who's been, been on the line listening, um, thank you for taking the time to join. We hope you have found this a, a helpful and informative program.
program. Um, so you'll see our information again is up on the screen. Um, if you have any questions, if you have any follow up, um, you know, items that you're looking for after tonight, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, we would love to be a resource to you. Um, to your families, you know, as you navigate this disease. So um, again, thank you all so much and have a wonderful night.